on behalf of the President's Commission on the Status of Women, um, specifically the committees, the Gender and Equity Committee, the Career Development Committee, and Information and Research Committee, along with the American Association of University Professors and our esteemed panel of speakers, we'd like to thank everyone for spending your time to come out today to hear this important topic and, and to hear from our esteemed panel. Um, can you give me an idea of how many staff are in the room? Faculty. Okay, and how many students do we have here? All right. That's, um, that's amazing. We would like to thank you for spending your time with us. Um, we hope you take away much of the information that we are going to provide to you and apply it in your life. So, Catherine is going to introduce our esteemed panel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is such a great turnout. I'm so glad that everybody here is interested in, in the topics that, you know, that we work so hard to promote and create, you know, promote awareness around campus. I'd um, like to welcome our guests today. Our panelists are uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ball, Chair of the History Department, um, to provide an historic overview of the issue of equal pay. Um, after that, Sean Ron, uh, the chair of our Information and Research Committee on the Commission of Status of Women, uh, will talk about our study on equal pay equity here at Wayne State's campus. Um, then we will hear from Dr. Bina Su from Wayne State's group on women in medicine and science. Um, she's going to talk about initiatives uh, related to promoting gender equity on, at Wayne State. And finally, uh, Michelle Fecteau uh, from the American Association of University Professors will discuss uh, legal and contract issues related to equal pay. Um, please welcome our guests. Last thing I wanted to mention, though, is uh, April 12th is um, um, Equal Pay Day. And we'd like to ask you, in support of Equal Pay Day, to wear red uh, to demonstrate your support. I think our panelists will probably talk a little bit more about Equal Pay Day, but uh, it represents the number of days into the next year that women work in order to have parity on uh, pay with men from the prior year. So uh, wear red on April 12th. I don't know how many of you are uh, apt scholars of the Bible, but from Leviticus, I want to quote, when a person makes an explicit vow to the Lord concerning the equivalent for a human being, the equivalent for a male shall be from 20 to 60 years of age, the equivalent shall be 50 shekels of silver by the sanctuary shekel. If the person is female, the equivalent is 30 shekels. This text from Leviticus, which is often quoted, I think probably stuns most of you, uh, in part because uh, there we have it 3,000 years ago, and women were worth about 60% of men when it came to weighing their economic value. Um, this ratio, with the exception of the 19th century, generally held until quite recently. Um, I'm sure that the first time I ever heard female to male wage ratios, someone said 58 cents on a man's dollar. Today it's 79 cents, 3,000 years after they wrote that text down. During the Industrial Revolution, the ratio of women's men to men's <coughs> wages actually declined to below 50%. If you looked at the wages of women working in agricultural fields or in industry, they would have been paid between 35 and 40 percent of an adult male earner. Now, for most of the 20th century, the ratio of women's wages to men's has recovered a bit and generally tended to increase to 79 cents today. And 
That is uh, still a little shocking to men's ears, to men's and women's ears. Actually, it's probably not all that shocking to some men's ears. But um, it's certainly an affront to the principle of economic and social equality. And yet, there's been remarkable stasis in the condition of women wage earners and wage earning economies in relation to their male counterparts. Now, there's something to be said, and I think as part of this, I want you to think about what the definition of economic activity might be or the definition or meaning of labor value is when it comes to a human being. Much of this ratio, this formula that has been historically handed down to us is built on a set of presumptions about what certain work means and how it should be valued and also what the people doing that work, their place in a social structure, what their responsibilities and obligations are. But that economic inequality has been around a long time. And it's also true that women's equality, especially in the workplace, has been a concern for women's rights advocates probably since the early 19th century. And that is about the time of the Industrial Revolution. It's about a time in which lots of things are changing, including the relative status of women to men, what the condition of, of freedom is of particular men and women across societies. And so the issue of equality of women and men's relative place within a specific society or group has been with us as a public issue, certainly since the early 19th century. And for the second wave of the women's movement in the 1960s and 70s, this issue of workplace equality has certainly provided the most reliable set of victories for women in terms of hiring, promotion, and employment security. So then and now, we have seen progress around specific issues. But feminist activism and equal pay and pay equity movements will not creating economic parity has also moved the needle so that women are earning more than ever before. But I want to take us back a few steps just to think about how we got there. In the early 19th century, the women's rights movement in the United States began to question women's economic status. But believe it or not, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton or um, Susan B. Anthony, or for that many f matter, Fanny Wright before her, or the Group Q Sisters from South Carolina, or any set of people began to ask these questions, also thinking about Francis Harper, and when they began to ask these questions, they didn't actually lead to the idea of equal pay, which is actually within a very patriarchal, a very uh, sexist society in which women and men did have or were perceived to have different, different value. People didn't immediately zoom toward are they paid equal. And there's a really important reason for that, one of which is that until the mid-19th century in the United States, later in the United Kingdom, and varying times in other countries, women were actually in a state um, where married women were understood to be under the condition of coverture. That's a very fancy legal term, but what it effectively means is that women's legal personality and their, their economic activity were actually subsumed under that of the husband. So that when they earned money, it didn't actually mean that much to them because they had absolutely no control over it. The law of coverture meant that all married women, and that constituted somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of the female population, basically when they earned wages or inherited property, they did not control it. Their husband, even if their husband was estranged for them, from them, living in a different state, had the right to come back and seize their wages. So for a feminist movement that's just trying to fight to get control over the wages, the notion of equal pay doesn't have that much significance. It doesn't have that much significance until you actually control your wages and your property. And it took uh, decades in the United States 
to repeal these laws and reassert women's control, their economic independence and sort of economic liberty to the point where they could control their wages, control their property. And something I didn't even tell you about because it's not even on the menu for today was that women didn't even control their children. They could not have custody of their children without their husband having surrendered it. So this was their major fight for a long time. And it really absorbed that first generation of women's advocates. By the late 19th century, as more, as sort of more economic opportunity opens up, as the United States begins to industrialize, as cities are built and there's more wage work available, the next struggle was access to employment. Because there were all kinds of reasons out there why you might not want to hire women. And those reasons, the employer's preference to discriminate, the the thought that women shouldn't do that kind of work, that they were too delicate for it, or they didn't have the mental capacity to do it, all those kind of mythologies were out there. And they created real cultural barriers to women taking basic jobs. And so when women work in the 19th century, the vast majority of them, if they're working for wages, are not working in factories. They're not working in offices. During most of the 19th century, they're actually working as domestic servants in other kinds of service or agricultural work. They are not working in what we would assume is a normal workplace for a person in the 20th century. And still, the few jobs that were available in industry, in the skilled trades, in professions, were things that had to be fought over, that women had to demand entrance into. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, it's where the focus of women's activism was. It was where women had to fight in order to be economic actors. So after that point, after that point, you can start to ask questions about women's wages. You can start to ask questions about how we're going to establish what that, those wages will be. After you've dealt with apprenticeship laws that basically kept women from doing certain kinds of work. After you've dealt with union prohibitions on women belonging to certain trades. After you've dealt with laws passed at the state level that protected women and kept them from dangerous trades like mining or like being a bartender because we know how dangerous that can be. <laughs> but discrimination had to be followed not just by do women get access to a job, but how were they hired? How were they promoted? Do they have employment security and eventually how are they paid? And that question really arises, strangely enough, not out of the women's movement that we identify as women's liberation, but it starts to be raised during World War II. It starts to be raised during World War II in part because there's a huge influx of women into the wage labor force. The causes of it were, of course, the demand for labor during World War II. And so something like six million new women workers enter the labor force from about 1941 to 1945. And while some of them leave after that, most of them stay. Some, not often in the same jobs they have during the war, but they stay in part-time employment, they stay, and they eventually become workers. And as the 20th century proceeds, female labor force participation rates drastically increase. Not so much in the beginning. Up to 1930, it's only about 25, 30%. But after 1930, it grows to where it is today, where female and male labor force participation rates are almost equal. And much of this, again, had to do with questions about labor demand. But also during World War II, it had to do with how do we keep, especially in war industry, well-paid union jobs, how do we keep them union, unionized, and how do we retain high wage rates? The result of which is that you saw unions 
which had kind of haltingly supported the general idea of women's equality, but not done a whole lot about it, during World War II began to embrace the idea of female equality, and especially the notion that women needed to earn equal pay. And during that period of time, you saw the first generation of women labor activists who are engaged in this struggle and who will be engaged in it for another 20 years. The same women who take it up during World War II are there in 1963 when President Kennedy appoints the Commission on the Status of Women. It's those same <coughs> women who begin to think about what laws do we need to ensure women's equality. And it's those women who will train an important generation of women union leaders who will ask those questions and pursue pay equality through the courts and through legislatures. That was the swinging open of the door. In the 1960s and 70s, through two different paths, women become active in the women's rights movement. The path that actually made the greatest impact on women's employment rose out of the National Organization of Women and other associated organizations that come out swinging and start to demand women's equality in hiring, promotion, employment security, and wages. And it is that group that begins to support and also to pursue the implications of the Equal Pay Act, of the Title VII, of the Equal Rights Act, and who will push for other laws that have since been passed. It makes sense that it's that generation. It's that generation because they are the largest group of women. Well, an economist could lay it out to you. Every cohort in the 20th century of women workers gets bigger and bigger, have longer and longer work histories, and are earning higher wages. But it's that generation that sort of sets the tone and it makes possible thinking about how you're going to do that. Um, in my own notes, I have things about the women who also made it possible by studying the problem. Uh, women radical economists like Heidi Hartman and Nancy Fulbright, uh, Claudia Golden, who was an economist who studied the history of women workers, or Alice Kessler Harris, Leslie Tentler, and Lynn Weiner, all of whom do these kind of foundational studies of the history of women and work that will go behind arguing for these measures for women's equality. Um, I want to raise one other issue before passing it on to the next speaker, which is that most of these people who are engaged in these activities are also engaged in an intellectual and political debate about the causes of women's inequality. There's a very long cause that I think is culturally rooted, as I've said, in differential perceptions about the value of women and also what women ought to be doing. That usually means something beyond the workplace. That usually means they bear heavier family obligations. That usually means that they have to have appropriate behavior, dress, and have appropriate ambition. That cultural piece is there. The argument is also how much structural conditions really matter in the end. Is it because women choose not to be paid better? And there are plenty of economists who will say that there is a large element of this which is about preference. But what they fail to understand and what we have to emphasize today is that culture and economics are not separable here. All of our notions about what is fair, what is just, what is appropriate for women as well as men in the workplace is a combination of what the structural possibilities are and what the cultural meanings have been. And it's the combined struggle of opening up ideas about not just that pay equity is sensible or rational, from an economic point of view, but also that it is emotionally and culturally appropriate for us to have this ambition. Thank you.
Thank you for the excellent perspective from the history. I learned a lot. So Sarah is passing out this activity sheet. So I will explain a bit when everyone gets a sheet. So as a, a graduate student at Wayne State, I study people at work, and I teach psychology in the workplace when I teach how the wars and the Civil Rights Act shapes the current workplace, uh, students often comment that, you know, since the Civil Rights Act, the discrimination is no longer in existence. I said, no, <laughs> that's just the beginning of the movement. So later on, we will see some current studies about this issue. So this is a worksheet to calculate two people's salary. So Jay and John joined a local university on the same day for the same job, and they're both offered the same package. Uh, but uh, Jay accepted, uh, accepted the offer, John negotiated salary as well as the annual raises. So John get, is getting a higher starting salary as well as a higher raises per year. So this is not a test. <laughs> so I would like you to use your phone or if you have a calculator, I don't know if anyone <laughs> still have a calculator, to calculate their salary at the end of the fifth year and to calculate their earning ratio just by taking Jane's salary out of John's salary. So you can work with your peers or talk about it. No, okay. So we can see from your answer key that by the end of fifth year, Jane's income is about 80% out of John's income. So what made that difference? The initial, the initial negotiation and applying for promotion and a higher annual raise <coughs> and a higher annual raise that's also from the initial negotiation so there are a lot of factors just accumulates to the eventual pay gap although this is just an abstract example in a local university assuming they started at the same place with the same qualification, but this is a very common phenomenon that can occur for uh, people who work at the same place. So for our students, if you enter into your workplace in the future, there are some things you need to consider before you apply for those jobs. The negotiation and when do you want to go up for a promotion or a raise to renegotiate your package. Those are different skills that you may consider to develop throughout the, throughout your career. So we CSW actually hosts a series of workshops on those skills, so we won't go into details about those. If you would like more information, you can contact Nanette <laughs> from CSW for more details. So. So today I would like to share some research we have done over in the past year and a half, maybe. This one? Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a reality show or something. <laughs> okay. Is this one? So we have been working on this research since the end of 2014. So I would like to share some key findings with you. So first, let's look at the university vision and mission. I think that's what has drawn me to the Wayne State University and that commitment to diversity has made a lot of people proud, including people in the community. They really appreciate that Wayne State put diversity on a really high level priority. For example, both our vision and mission stated that we would like to prepare a, a 
a stu diverse student body to succeed. And based on that vision and mission, uh, last year, I think Wayne State put out a new strategic plan um, for now until 2021, uh, which also, again, emphasize, emphasize diversity. So beyond a diverse body of students, it also says that we want them to flourish in a diverse environment. So this is not limited to just students. We also want to make a whole Wayne State environment, including faculty, staff, and people who work in the community to appreciate diversity. So under that strategic plan, diversity and inclusion is one of the seven focuses, full focus areas. The so first goal of that is to really show every group and individual is valued. So I think pay equity is an important part of it, to use compensation to show appreciation to different pe people from different groups with, different, with diverse backgrounds. So since the 70s, COSW has been asked as an advisory uh, capacity to the Office of President to provide information for the President to make important decisions. And as a part of the strategic plan, the, the most re recent one, we aim to examine the pay structure, uh, comparing the pay between men and women to provide information to the President. So currently, we have submitted a report to the President, and the President has indicated a need to further investigate the issue. So we are partnering with different organizations on campus to promote awareness of uh, pay equity issues. Uh, so today's event is one of that. And the research will continue when we get more in-depth data. So that's a brief background of why we're doing this research. So although we have a really high commitment to diversity, now we're trying to use some evidence to show that we're actually working toward that goal. So from your salary calculation activity, you have practiced how to earn, how to calculate the earning ratio based on just two individuals. Uh, for comparing different groups, we look at the median income. Uh, why do we use the median? Because that's just the exact midpoint of the distribution. So 50% of people in your group will earn less than you, but 50% will earn higher than you. And that number is not very sensitive to extreme numbers. For example, there's, they may, there may be one person happen to get a really high income as a woman in your, in your group then the median statistic is less influenced by that extreme income. So that earning ratio calculated based on median is more reliable in general. And we can also calculate a pay gap using one minus that earning ratio. So for example, if there's an 80% uh, earning ratio, then the pay gap would be 20%. People usually use either term in their report and try to communicate the same idea. So for example, the U overall pay gap in the U.S. is 79% um, with 21% pay gap. So uh, 79 is the earning ratio. In Michigan, that gap is larger with 25% pay gap and 75% earning ratio, uh, which is ranked probably the, the last 10, the 10, one of the uh, 10 worst, worst states on um, pay gap. So Wayne State, when we look at 2014, there's an overall 19% pay gap with 81% earning ratio. So that's slightly better than the national average. But we know that overall number indicate a lot of factors, like maybe women are more likely to be low, lower paid positions. So we further break down into different groups to look at this issue. So for example, we categorize P 
people based on different position levels, faculty, leadership, staff, and research support, we can see pay gaps that exist in both faculty leadership and staff positions, especially faculty and staff. And by division, we have just listed eight large colleges and schools. And I want to draw your attention to school of medicine, business, and law. They tend to be the traditionally male, more male-dominated field. They are all employees in the school. Yeah, all full-time employees. And faculty, uh, we happen to have some data from the 80s, so we did a comparison. Actually, in the 80s, the pay gap was not that substantial, but for associate, associate professor, that pay gap has increased over the years. And how can we explain a gap? So based on the data available to us, we have looked at rank, years in service, also career paths, such as this specific discipline you're in, and also different tracks. For example, for the data at School of Medicine, we are able to break down into different specific tracks they are on. Then we are able to explain majority of the gap by accounting for these factors, but there's still a small gender pay gap there after accounting for these factors. However, at the current stage, we don't have a comprehensive data set to account for all possible explanations. Uh, based on a national research, they found a 7% pay gap after they control for a number of different factors. For example, college major, GPA institution, uh, occupational factors such as uh, occupation, their economic sector, hours worked, among unemployed since graduation, also a number of personal factors such as age, location, and marital status. So after accounting for all the factors you can possibly think of at this point, there is still a substantial pay gap. And so right now, what we need is to obtain more comprehensive information. By doing that, we really need people who know access to those data, to those information, to get support from you for us to continue pursuing the analysis. And one of the explanations for the significant pay gap we observed at the school level, also looking at big divisions, this gender representation really come out as the most serious issue. So when we look across different uh, classifications, big classifications, academic faculty and leadership position, those are the two main fields that women are really underrepresented. So when you break down to different colleges and schools, Again, engineering, business, they tend to be the more unbalanced uh, divisions. So if uh, gender representation is unbalanced, uh, males are more likely to be in decision-making positions than deciding who will be promoted, then there may be a factor that gender similarity may play a role that will further limit women's opportunity to get promoted or to get a pay raise. So when we focus on faculty, we can see when you move up the rank, the representation of women really goes down, goes down. But when you compare 1986 and 2014, the gap is slowly closing. So how about our students? I know we have a number of students here. Before yeah. we go on, I'd like to ask a question about the law school. Yeah. 
is, according to your data, it said there was almost 60% of employees were female in the law school, but yet they had one of the hugest pay gaps. Mm -hmm. no, almost 60%. Yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have the opportunity to really break down the within law school to look at their types of positions. So how about our students? Is there any predictions many years after grad graduation? So based on the US data, even one year after degree completion for undergraduate students, there's a 18% pay gap. So that's very striking. For Wayne State students, we are able to obtain the data for students who are seven years post-degree as well as 10 years post-degree. We can see from the same levels of university, same level of education, there's uh, about 13, 12 to 13 percent pay gap seven years after graduation. And that gap increased to 20% 10 years after graduation. So as I'm also teaching, <laughs> so as a professor to some of the students, I really want to have the opportunity to let them know there's something you need to do to help them to graduate into a more equal environment after graduation. So that, I think that's a good segue to the next presentation where Michelle is going to talk about the legal and contractual issues that you can learn about to further promote equal pay. Are you going to use a screen? No. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, just a little bit more background on me. I, um, I'm here at Wayne State, and I'm the executive director of the AAUP. We're also affiliated with the American Federation of Teachers. And I worked in the Labor Study Center for about 10, 11 years. And prior to that, I was a union organizer and a union rep since, like, 1986. Um, so, and I've worked in different industries and, and things like that. So, um, so, but I'm going to focus how the laws might apply here. So, I wanted to give you an overview of just some of the basic laws, um, both federal and state, that address um, uh, equal pay and discrimination, um, gender and other types. So, as we learned from the history from Liz, um, 1963 was sort of a culmination of a lot of things um, in history, and it led to this Equal Pay Act. Um, we also have, in, soon after, the Civil Rights Act of 64, after the March on Washington with Martin Luther King. Um, and many of you probably know that the whole um, discussion about sex discrimination or gender discrimination was thrown in at the last minute to try to derail the Civil Rights Act because people thought, oh, if we put that in, you know, we'll get a whole lot of folks in the Congress that won't vote for that because that's such a crazy idea. But it did pass with the gender discrimination um, prohibition. The uh, Michigan's Elliott Larson Act was soon after. And for us as state employees, it can have, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a vehicle for us in, in state employment. Uh, then there was the Pregnancy Discrimination Act in 78. Oftentimes women were terminated once they had, became pregnant. Um, so that was made clear that that was a prohibited act uh, that will really affect your pay if you get terminated. <laughs> um, and then you see this huge gap from 78 to 93. Um, and in 93, there was the Family Medical Leave Act. And that was really passed and debated to protect women because women primarily were the ones who would take care of children. And they're also the ones who take care of elders um, primarily. And they're the ones who would have, it would affect their employment and they wouldn't have job security to come back to while doing this. So it was an attempt um, to um, protect women. It's, it applies to men and women. Men get paternity leave under this act, although it's unpaid. Um, they have the rights to go off and take paternity leave and come back and have their job secure. 
and the uh, Lead Better Fair Pay Act, which we heard about. Um, maybe you've heard about it. Uh, when Obama came in, it was his first major act. Um, and that was, beca- that was because the Equal Pay Act in 60, well, the, the laws previously had a, um, is a time limit. You have to file within like 180 days, generally, unless you have a good lawyer. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, the Supreme Court in 2007 <laughs> said that Lily Ledbetter had blown the time limits because although she filed suit as soon as she found out that people doing her same job were being paid significantly more, men, she should have filed it once when the management decided to pay her less, even though she didn't know. It was a nonsensical um, ruling by our U.S. Supreme Court. So when Obama came in, this law was passed, which um, changed the law of the land from what the Supreme Court had said, and it says you can file when you find out. (laughs) Or actually, every paycheck you get that is less than a man's starts a whole new cycle of um, a time limit. So it gives people a lot more time to file. So that was a positive. Um, And then I'm going to talk about the Public Employment Relations Act. That's the state law that gives you the right to join unions and organize. Um, and, uh, And there's a lot of reasons why those rights have a direct impact on wages and equality. So let me, I'm not, I just, I put in here some basic information about, about these. I'm not going to read every detail. Uh, you can read them on your own. But the Equal Pay Act, by and large, um, has not been as successful as people have hoped. And generally because the, the last bullet point, unequal compensation, only a show based on um, you know, uh, these other, there's basically there's other things that could be um, uh, added into it. The second bullet point maybe is that that would be better. You have to show that it's a substantially equal skill, effort, and responsibility are performed under similar conditions. And because there's so much diversity and differences and people have come to work with different backgrounds and um, it's hard, it's a very hard, um, hard to prove this. And so it has, unless you're doing pretty much the exact same job with the exact same qualifications or pretty close to that, it's hard to win um, under this. So there's some discussion with Hillary running, um, talking about the Equal Pay Act sort of being revamped in a way that's more applicable and usable. But it hasn't been a great uh, tool for us. Um, Then in 93, so we have Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and that covers a whole lot of areas. And like I said, it includes gender. Um, and what I think is important, and the second bullet point, is it not only prevents uh, or prohibits intentional uh, sex discrimination, but unintentional. Because a lot of times this happens not because somebody says, I hate women, you know, and I'm not going to make sure women get paid less. It's usually these unintentional biases that are based on stereotypes and um, uh, you know, sort of baggage that comes with being a woman. And so uh, so we look at, when we look at what's unintentional, you often have to look at the statistics and the studies that show, for instance, like this great research that's been done by, um, already presented here by Sean, that, Sean, that it is, it exists, whether it's intentional or not, it's there. And um, so it might be something to consider. But again, we've got these issues with different categories, different types of disciplines, what the outside market will pay for them. So there's also, um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard argument to make, and it requires a lot of research, but you can do it by doing a careful analysis. It, Title VII prevents or prohibits discrimination and hiring, firing, and all of these, these things um, here. So... Um, and I, I think those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, there is a retirement plans, leaves, and benefits. Now, my understanding was before I got here that the union, AAUP, had, um, had a group of women who looked at the discrepancies in the way that men and women were paid. And they, therefore, when into their TIA craft for fidelity, were entitled to extra payments in recognition of the fact that they had been paid, underpaid 
for years. So that was uh, one example that took place here. Um, so it, it encompasses a lot of a lot of things. So transfer promotion, that kind of thing. Um, moving on. Uh, it also includes harassment, and we probably all heard of that with the, uh, in the press and whether it be here in your workplace. You, there's a policy against harassment uh, at the university, um, but the harassment you can be it has to be based on your gender. So it can't be because your your chair or your boss doesn't like you. It has to show that it's a pattern. <coughs> that it's because of your gender that you are being harassed. Or um, so if you were a man, it, it wouldn't happen to you. So there's there's that. But and the ra harassment has to lead to the level that it interferes with your ability to do your job. So we all know about that. Um, then there's the employment decisions based on stereotypes, assumptions. Abilities, traits, things like that. And, and li listening to the historical data, there, there still are a lot of assumptions. You know, um, this person's probably going to drop off. She's young. She's probably going to get pregnant. I'm probably, you know, not going to make the commitment to the job. You know, those kind of things. And, um, you know, are there, you know, this guy's a real go-getter. This woman's going to be because she's having a baby. Maybe she should. Wow. Sorry. Um, <laughs> maybe she shouldn't get tenure. Maybe she wouldn't be as committed. Those kinds of things. Now, the state law is similar, but the, I like the state law because it also includes other things um, that sometimes are associated with discrimination of women. Which, so it includes height, weight, familial status, marital status. And, and so if someone, for instance, is discriminated because she is a single mom and pregnant, and we've had a case of this, actually, I'm dealing with something similar uh, to that, that kind of a case right now in, in our union where someone was treated poorly because she was a single mom and uh, got pregnant. Uh, that would be a violation of the Elliot Larson uh, Civil Rights Act. So there's, so there's a lot of basic protections in the law. Pregnancy, pregnancy discrimination. Um, so generally, I look at it that if... Uh, someone is pregnant or complications due to pregnancy and they don't want to accommodate with sort of a modification or adjustment in your work, but they would do it for a male counterpart who maybe had a heart attack, although I don't like creating babies with heart attacks, but um, <laughs> it's a similar um, length of time that you generally need off at six weeks or so. Um, that would be an example of uh, a violation of pregnancy discrimination. Family Medical Leave Act, like I said, it entitles you to 12 weeks of uh, leave um, for a serious health condition of you, your child, your spouse, or your uh, parents. And, um, and there's some very strong language in there that if you use the FMLA, uh, it can't be used as a negative factor in your evaluations. Um, and uh, if somebody interferes with your rights under FMLA, you can sue them personally as well as the institution. So it's, it's some, some very good language in there uh, that, that can help folks if they need to, to do that. And as I said, the majority of people who take time off to care for children, spouses, parents, are women. I mentioned this, um, so you already know about this. Um, now, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the, the, the rights to unionize. Um, so it's, it's usually, it's, it's known as PARA. It's modeled after the, the private sector law. You might know about the Flint sit-down strikes that happened in the mid-30s. It led to um, <clears throat> unionization and the passage, and it was related to the passage of the 1935 uh, National Labor Relations Act. And it gives people the right to organize and collectively bargain wages, hours, and working conditions. Now, um, we talk about negotiating individually and being a good negotiator for yourself individually. And that's important. But if someone doesn't want to hire you and you're out there on your own, you know, if someone has these biases and it's you against a company or a university, um, it's, it's hard. And then your recourse is to go to one of those, those laws and file a lawsuit and get an attorney. Or go to the EEOC and file a charge and then they tell you you can hire an attorney. So it's, it's expensive to sue, um, and um, it's personally trying to sue, and it takes a long time. 
so it, there is recourse there. There is, uh, you know, laws that you can rely on. But I think the idea of collectively bargaining as a group. Now, collective bargaining is generally associated with unions. You have the right to unionize, form a union. And at that point, the employer has to do certain things. Once you, if you're recognized as a union, where 50% of the people in your unit agree that they want a union, the employer has to negotiate. They are bound by law to sit down and negotiate for wages, hours, and working conditions. So that means, and like we have in our contract, we have language specifically geared towards discrimination, towards providing data, uh, comprehensive data about uh, gender or other employment or other things related to that statistics um, that we can use. We publish. Many of you may have seen our. We publish the salaries of, for the whole university, everyone in the university, every year on our website, which is where a lot of the studies on gender equity have come from at Wayne State. We do that we, so that people can know and compare themselves and help them negotiate, but also to provide data to do more comprehensive studies. Once with this information, we have the right to file a grievance if we feel there is um, discrimination, even if it's unintentional, um, based on gender. And we can file it under our Article 7, which talks as a non-discrimination clause. So we have certain rights, and then the employer has to sit down and negotiate with us. And if they, we can't reach out a settlement, they can go to an arbitrator, which is a neutral third party judge that both sides agree to go to, to, to come up with this. And then this is one of the vehicles they, that was used, you know, this language of the union was used to get those extra payments into the, um, uh, the retirement system. So although advisory committees are really good and important, it doesn't compel the administration to do anything. Right? So one of the reasons why I reached out and we talked to folks from the um, Commission on the Status of Women and Bina, who's a member of our union, and the graduates um, union who, who that is also involved in this, um, is to see if we can have the analysis that is being done by this commission and the collective and union rights that we have uh, at the AEP and the GEOC and other unions um, to see if we can actually move an agenda to uh, do something about this, to, to improve the university and to really make it fulfill its commitment to diversity. So, um, and by the way, we're having a work group. We're developing a work group with some folks in it to come around and to uh, join together with ideas and strategies about ways to do that. And we're having our first meeting later today. And uh, anyone who is interested in participating or being a part of this, um, we welcome you. Uh, so there is another thing here. I think it's uh, because of this, because we can access information and compel negotiations and have the right to negotiate around these issues and have the administration or employers meet with us. Um, that's part of the reason why the wage gap among union employees is half the size of wage gap among non-union workers of that same classification. So they're, they're, um, there's a certain benefit, a union benefit that is, that is had here. Um, and female union members tend to earn more overall than, than men. I mean, that women were not unionized. Um, that I mentioned this, but specifically in our contract, we have um, prohibitions against discrimination, which are um, then subject to the grievance procedure. Um, provides for regular access to salary data, both under law and under the contract, and allows us to be uh, organized. And in our contract, if you organize, if you participate in the union, that actually counts as service, which is you're given credit for as an employee. Uh, is something you should do. So um, that is my general overview, and um, and I guess we'll be taking questions later. So I won't ask for questions now. Okay, thank you.
So everybody's having fun. It's an, a very interesting topic. <clears throat> I'll pick up where, uh, from where the previous speakers left off. I'm going to talk about gender equity initiatives at uh, specifically the Wayne State University School of Medicine. I'm a neonatologist. I pra uh, and are women's, and I'm also the representative to the AAMC for the Women in Medicine and Science group at the School of Medicine. And uh, we've been collaborating with the Commission on the Status of Women and have done some uh, collaborative research. Uh, we've been having discussions about initiatives. So today I'm going to talk to you about the Women in Medicine and Science group at the School of Medicine, our collaboration with other women's groups across the campus, including the COSW, the American Medical Women's Association, the Medical Students Group. We are also collaborating with the AUP, which Michelle uh, represents. Uh, and then we are uh, collaborating with uh, other bodies on the campus, and I'll talk more about it. I'll talk about the initiatives that we have discussed. Now, these are not formalized. These are just discussions, uh, but I would like to share that with you. So our women in medicine and science group is relatively young in its infancy. We were established as a committee in 2013, and we function under the aegis of the Wayne State University School of Medicine Office of Faculty Affairs. And we also work with the Association of Mer American Medical Colleges Group on Women in Medicine and Science, and this is the logo for our group that we have developed. So the goals of the WINS group, as we call it, at Wayne State University is to create a support system for other women faculty, facilitate regular uh, meetings of the faculty, facilitate networking, connect with other local women's groups, nominate faculty for professional development workshops and seminars, encourage mentorship, nominate women for awards and leadership positions, and promote women invited speakers. So I have to, this is a disclaimer. Whatever I'm going to talk about is not policy. It's not formalized. These are discussions we are having, and some of the initiatives have already begun. So this is the structure of our advisory group for the Women in Medicine and Science group. Uh, we have four major subcommittees. Uh, our most uh, active committee is the mentoring committee. Uh, and this, we have enthusiastic people who want to mentor faculty. Uh, in the basic sciences. And so we have separate individual groups of individuals mentoring these various subcategories. So basic science faculty, clinical faculty, postdocs, medical students. They also work with the departmental delegates to work with department members to promote mentorship. And we also eventually want to get involved with pipeline programs at the university when middle school and high school students from underrepresented minorities visit Wayne State to promote an interest in the STEM fields. We want to talk to the women or the girls in those groups to get them fired up from an early stage to pursue a career in the STEM fields. We also have, uh, I'm going to next talk about our membership and outreach subcommittee, which will be developing a web page, has liaison with CUSW and the American Medical Women's Association. It uh, will energize the membership of our group, will perform community outreach activities, collaborate with the diversity office, and also promote for the affiliate faculty at Wayne State University. The program planning committee hosts programs like the one today, uh, similar programs for the WIMS group, and I'll talk about the programs that we've hosted in the last year. And finally, I come to the Gender Equity Committee, which actually started off by working with the CUSW in the research that Dr. Ran presented, in which we looked at the uh, pay gap, gender pay gap, at Wayne State University in general, and specifically at the School of Medicine. And from the nice graphs that she showed you, it was evident that the School of Medicine is the largest school within Wayne State University, and it made sense to look at that school by itself and compare it to the rest of the university. So this is a regression analysis that is based on the same data that Dr. Ryan showed before. And what I want to go over is, this is a regression analysis, which is for all employees, university-wide and school and medicine, uh, of medicine-wide. And then there's a second analysis, which is only for the academic faculty. So the assistant associate and full professors, and again, university level and school of medicine level. So in the regression analysis, you will see that gender 
is a significant contributor to pay differences amongst all employees. Other factors that were significant that were mentioned previously were years in service, professional position, and gender uh, and race. <clears throat> when this analysis was performed for the School of Medicine, gender was again significant, even after controlling for years in service, professional position, and race. Now, when we did the analysis only for the academic faculty, when we did the analysis university-wide, and this time we took into account also the track, whether the individual was on research track or clinical track, and whether uh, and the academic rank, gender gap was still significant at the university level. However, gender gap was not significant at the School of Medicine level. And in all these models, about 40 to 50 percent of the variation is explained by these factors. So one of the things that comes across is, in addition to gender, that academic rank is one of the biggest drivers of the differences in pay between men and women. So in a sense, there is, in addition to being a gender gap, there's an opportunity gap. And that's what our group wants to focus on, to narrow the opportunity gap. And <clears throat> before I want to go up to the, onto the opportunity gap, this data has several limitations, as has been discussed before. For clinicians, one of the major limitations is that it only represents the Wayne State University portion of a physician's salary. This is the AAUP data that is available under a FOIA request. It does not include the salaries of physicians that come from practice plans or from other incentives. And so it is a limited data set. And we want to work with other groups across the campus to get more detailed data to be, to be able to make more uh, firm conclusions about this data set. <clears throat> Furthermore, there is a lack of uniform definition. I'm pretty sure it's very different to compare an associate professor in medicine to the one in business or engineering or in liberal arts. So that is a limitation. Uh, even within medicine, it's very, uh, very hard to compare an inf infectious disease doctor with an intensivist and have some understanding of the pay structure of these two professions. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about our efforts and how we were stumped at that time. So when we did this first analysis with CUSW, we decided to go back to other groups, women's group, and see if we could get a longitudinal idea of what happens, what happens to an undergrad student once a student graduates and applies to med school and from med school to residency and from residency to faculty position. How is the proportion of women wearing in these subgroups? So we wanted to look at that, and we contacted all these groups. Our goal is to continue to longitudinally follow up our members at Wayne State University to see what happens to them and ultimately create a repository so we can query the data every few years and see how women are progressing across Wayne State University. So this is a cartoon from the Association of American Medical Colleges and it pretty much sums up that women are <clears throat> represent about 40, just under half uh, the number of applicants for med school, and as they progress up through this profession, only 16% end up being deans, only 21% become full professors. That's the opportunity gap that I'm talking about. And we said, you know, we really need to see what's happening at Wayne State. Do we know what's happening at Wayne State? Yeah. Do we have a problem at all? Is Wayne State so much better than the national average that we don't have a problem and we really need to shut down our groups? And so we looked at our data. The first uh, tumbling, stumbling block was that we don't have good data. So I approached uh, Dr. Bromley. She is faculty uh, at uh, class at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I wanted data about our pre-med students. The best we could get was that 42%, sorry, 42% of the students graduating from Wayne State University were female applicants for Wayne State Medical School. We don't know about women applying to other medical schools. So it's a very, it, it, it just gives you a very, a snapshot of one aspect, and it's an incomplete picture at best, but that's what we have. And we need to build up from what we have and move on to the next step. So then we asked the uh, medical student body, and Dr. Diane Levine helped us with her uh, students, to figure out that, uh, sorry, before I go there, this is from the pre-med program, of the women that applied to med school, Sorry. Of the women that applied to med school, 30% that were accepted were women, 
and 70% that were accepted were male. But it doesn't tell us how many women from outside schools got accepted. So it's a really distorted data set. Then we went to the medical school data and we said how many women and men matched into residency programs. And again, the pattern repeated. Less than half of the women matched. Less of the, than half the students who matched were women and more than half of the students that matched were men. Then we looked at the total number of women residents in our residency program. And about a third of our medical residents are women and two thirds of them are men. If you look at the duration of residency, in the first year of residency, women are about two thirds of men. And in the second, third, fourth, and up to the seventh year, you see that the number of women dwindles. So women are selecting to do residencies that are three years only. Most of them are not electing uh, to go into residencies that are longer, and typically these happen to be surgical specialties. And so there is a uh, lack of diversity in some specialties. Uh, like we mentioned before, in the, at Wayne State, there's lack of diversity in the School of Business, in Engineering. Similarly, within the School of Medicine, we see that there are male-dominated fields, and we want to break those barriers. And this is a graph that Sean already shared. This data is for the School of Medicine. What she showed you was for the university wide. And you can see it shows the progression from administrative position, research sports staff, postgraduate trainee, academic faculty, and leadership position. And in this scissors plot, you can see that women are overrepresented in the lower paying positions and underrepresented in the higher paying positions. And if you look at the distribution of academic faculty alone and break them into instructors, assistant professors, associate professors, and professors, you can see, as she pointed out, that this gap is narrowing over time. <clears throat> so what we want to do, one of our major goals of the Women in Medicine and Science group is to provide mentorship uh, to our faculty for uh, professional development. We want to monitor the number of women in leadership positions, the number of undergraduate and graduate female students, female faculty representation on campus per school. So we just don't want to look at the School of Medicine. We want to look at across the border. We want to look at all the schools and see how women and men are progressing. We want to look at recruitment and retention of women faculty. <coughs> and we want to regularly review our pay, have a salary review committee to see if women are being paid <coughs> equitably. Now, there is basis for this, as we've been discussing this whole afternoon. And this is another uh, similar take on the same data. This was published in the Time magazine in 2015, and it shows the best and worst cities for equal pay. And Detroit is right near the bottom, uh, with a uh, difference of 3.8%. <clears throat> and President Obama has recognized the importance of salary equity. And in 2014, he passed an executive order saying that federal contractors have to submit salary information for all employees for gender. And that's why at the VA, I'm told, there is very little difference in pay between men and women. So the federal government has kind of addressed this problem. Uh, in addition, employers are not allowed to prohibit employees from discussing salary. In 2016, very recently, in January or February, the Equal Opportunity Commission has asked all employees, uh, employers to collect salary data for gender, race, and ethnicity, and it has to be actually filled out in the EEO-1 form and submitted to the federal government, and the first collection will be in 2017. So this will take the burden of fighting for equal pay from the women and turn it over to the government. <clears throat> what are we going to do to address the opportunity gap? We are going to have career development programs. Uh, we are going to make sure that women have equitable access to intramural research grants and Europe grants, that <coughs> women participate in governance structures. We want to diversify sex segregated subspecialties, orthopedic surgery, interventional cardiology, neurosurgery. These are fields where women are not represented. These are harder uh, subspecialties to follow. And so we want to make sure that women get representation in these specialties. We want women to get uh, campus recognition, grants, and sabbaticals, and we want to monitor these over time. We want to give CME credit for attending workshops like the one today. So, uh, And that's very important for medicine, and I guess it's not so important over here. But for us, it's a major thing, so we are working on that as well for our members. 
uh, our program planning committee has uh, sponsored several events uh, in the last year. There was a gender pay gap event at Wayne State University where a speaker from COSW came to talk about the research that was presented today. We recognize women who achieve promotion and tenure. We had a seminar by a neurosurgeon, a woman neurosurgeon, who had done a TED talk and she delivered an adaptive talk to us, finding the right fit of guide for women in medicine and science. It was a very nice talk and it's on the internet if you guys want to access it. How do I know I'm ready for promotion and tenure? We had a panel discussion for P&T factors. We have reports from women who attend professional development workshops, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a subsequent slide. And upcoming in, on April 5th, 2016, we'll have the Kathy Kramer Memorial Lecture. Now, Kathy Kramer was an orthopedic surgeon at Wayne State University. Unfortunately, she died at a young age because of cancer. And in her memory, this Kathy uh, Kramer lecture is held, and a woman orthopedic surgeon delivers the keynote address. And so uh, we are hoping a lot of the Wayne State community will be present at that lecture. We also encourage our women faculty to take advantage of programs that are meant for all faculty, men and women, that are hosted by the Office of Faculty Affairs. And we encourage them to take advantage of these professional development opportunities for improving teaching, the MedEd portal, promotion and tenure series, setting goals and fulfilling commitments, and again, uh, more learning uh, sessions. Uh, the AAMC, which is the body that governs the, our profession, uh, recognizes that there is a paucity of women at the higher levels, and to encourage women's participation in leadership, they hold two important seminars called the Early Women in Medi uh, Medicine and Science and the Mid-Women in Medicine and Science Seminar. Now, the first one, the early one is meant for women who are assistant professors. The second one is meant for women who are at the associate professor rank. Other criteria are given here. And I'm told by the people who have had the privilege of attending these seminars that these are just amazing workshops that uh, cover a variety of topics. Last year's session, for the Early Wins program covered uh, working through differences personality types at work, time management and organization skills, communicating as a leader, conflict management, negotiation, and then uh, discipline-specific seminars. They even had a session on yoga and Zumba. Uh, the mid -wins program also covered very similar uh, uh, topics, including finances and business. Uh, and all these sessions have CME credits. Now, as you can tell, it's very important to me to get CME, but I understand that's not important to you. What are we doing? What do we think is important for work-life integration for women? And we think that uh, Wayne State University needs to have policies and programs to promote work-life integration. Uh, and Michelle talked about these, pregnancy leave, parental leave, telecommute, stop the tenure clock, which is available at Wayne State, child care close to work, and promoting breastfeeding by having lactation rooms. Uh, we want to encourage uh, climate and culture at Wayne State University that is uh, friendly towards women. We want to have policies, uh, policies for meeting times that are family friendly. We want to do a needs assessment survey. The last one we did was a few years ago to find out what are the things that women faculty would benefit from in terms of programming by our group. And one of the more important things, I think, is to get men involved in the conversation. It's important to engage men. Uh, most of the women's group I've noticed, uh, you know, confine the attendance of their events to women. However, I think all these groups can be more effective by engaging men. Because men can be advocates, uh, stakeholders, and agents of change. Gender equality liberates not only women, but also men from prescribed social roles and gender stereotypes. And I want to quickly play a clip. How do I get to it, Shana? Just a second. So this is uh, international. But here's the message. Tomorrow is International Women's Day. And at the crack of dawn, I'm headed to Texas to interview former First Lady Laura Bush, who is hosting an event at the Bush Center in Dallas called Voices of Hope. 
which among other things, highlights the most unconscionable things done to women around the world. The Taliban won't let women listen to music, go to school, or leave the house without being covered head to toe in a burqa. And if a woman dares to violate the rules, she risks being publicly stoned in a stadium in front of crowds of cheering men. Women around the world living under Sharia law endure the unthinkable simply for being women, which brings me to this. On this International Women's Day Eve, it'd be a good time for us women to recognize that American men, let's give American men a shout out. Things aren't perfect. For instance, we still don't have equal pay for equal work. But American men are by far, very by far, the best men on the planet. And we American women, we may not say it, but we know that. And American men deserve to hear that from us. And that's my off record. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to, I think I've pretty much covered everything I had to say. And I'm going to stop here. I think it's time. And we'll take questions. This is a question for all the presenters at this time. And there's also an evaluation form going around right now that we can ask you to complete before you do leave here as well. Yeah, yes. Um, my name is Kim Morgan. I'm the chair of the COSW. And I've been working on... Uh, this particular project from the angle of the provost and the president. And I wanted to make sure that you all understand that both of them are very, very interested in this topic and are on board with us moving forward. So we're in the process of working that out. It's going to take time, but we're in the process of working that out. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Another question from the information that's been presented today, I'm going to ask, what's next? What should individual women, um, groups of women, what should we do? We, we're aware of the issues now, we're aware of some of the things that are happening, but what should be our steps? How should we proactively move forward? Well, I tend to think if you, you know, that we have this work group, so if you're interested in doing something collectively and hopefully, you know, we can come to filing a grievance if we work, you know, cooperatively with the relationships developed by, um, you know, the COSW and others with the administration here. It might be an opportunity to come and bring your energy and ideas to support that. Um, I'd also say just, you know, stick up for each other in your workplace. If you see a co-worker um, not being treated appropriately or feeling, you know, Put upon because you know, for, and it's related to, especially no matter what it's related to, but you know, if, if you see some discrimination on an individual level, go up and talk to that person and uh, make sure they're not, they know they're not alone, and support each other, even in your immediate work mode. Yeah, I think you have to be <coughs> aware of that this exists. I think my first reaction that I became aware of this was it's not possible, it doesn't exist. Not today. And I think we are selling ourselves short. <coughs> we are so proud of the progress. A lot of progress has been made, right? And we think that's enough. But it's unfairness to anybody is not acceptable. We have to be aware of our rights, and we have to have the skills to negotiate. We have to understand that's the culture for the work environment today. And the other thing is, if it doesn't feel right, it probably is not right. Go find out more about it or talk to somebody about it uh, to figure out what you don't know, why it doesn't feel right, and figure out what's the law to back you up or policy to back you up. Yeah, I don't think the decision is right for today. And um, I'm asking that, do we have access to this data on the website? This, uh, all this information is going to be us. For anybody who has attended, make sure you sign in, give your access ID. All uh, we do is we collect the presenter's information. We need to forward that to you as a thank you for attending. Um, and we can also, if it's okay, you all can post it on um, the uh, Wayne State's. If you provide the PowerPoints, I will attach them to the YouTube and the website and the blog and all the others. So, as long as I will get the information, I'll post it. So it'll be on the, uh, the our chapter, the AAUPAFT website as well, which is aaupaft.org.
And just real quick, if you are meeting, please feel free to take some food with you on the way as well. We still have tons of food back there.